So where does this stand currently then? Well, it stands that also you have the United the, the day after his testimony, the the uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee by seventeen to zero, <laughs> uh, with all all Republican senators and all Democratic senators all unanimously voting to to uh, send to the floor of the Senate a sixty four page bill uh, asserting in its findings that our United States government is in possession of, uh, of myriad pieces of information about the UFO phenomenon uh, and that in non-intelligent or non-human uh, intelligence. And it says it in the findings uh, and that they, they are uh, setting up a controlled disclosure program uh, to get this information rolled out uh, to the American people and to the world over a seven year period. Uh, I mean, this is extraordinary. Uh, that this is a this is another extraordinarily important step that was taken, and and it passed virtually unanimous through the United States Senate. Okay, and it went over to the House side, and we we do know that for the sixty four page bill was kind of honed down to a twenty four page bill. Uh, but the but the reality is the twenty four page bill that was passed by the House, and therefore had been passed into law. And signed by President Biden, which is the law, has now mandated that all six of our United States military services, all 18 of our United States intelligence agencies, all 32 of our United States Defense Department agencies, and uh, they, they all are ordered to gather together every single piece of information they have acquired pertaining to the UFO phenomenon and the non-human intelligence that's, that's understood to be responsible for it, are to gather that all together and have it available uh, in a, a, a digitized and retrievable form by October 18th of 2024. Uh, so the, they, they said 300 days from the passage of the statute. The statute was passed on December 22nd of 2023. And so you compute it out, and we're talking about October 18th of this year, they are ordered to have all of that information gathered together and have it be made available um, as soon as possible right thereafter to the National Archives. And all information that is more than 25 years old is to be released to the public, which covers Roswell, which covers Aztec, which covers you know uh, Project Blue Book, uh, covers all 700 cases in Project Blue Book that were classified and were never acknowledged publicly. You know, all of that information would be covered, uh, and, and people don't realize that that's happening right now. You know, all they do is they're, they're wringing their hands saying, oh, there was a 64 page bill that would have set up an independent panel to review it all. Uh, but oh no, it got all stripped down to only 24 pages. People don't realize the 24 pages that, that got preserved are extraordinary. Uh, and what's actually been passed uh, and what's been mandated now. A, a podcast on YouTube and you tell someone, oh, there's this big, you know, October 18th. Oh, where did you hear that? Ah, oh, there's this YouTube channel. Instantly people are going, oh, whoa, whoa, I've, I've lost interest. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, but all they have to do, all they have to do is is go in, uh, get the uh, the uh, provision. I mean, I, I should hear. All, all, they, all they have to do is go get the uh, uh, here it is uh, of the national national security act uh, the national security act the the uh, what is it the uh, and the national defense authorization act okay United States national author uh, national author national what is it uh, NSA the national defense authorization act okay. NDAA the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1833. 183. Okay. Uh, and, uh, or get Section 1841. Okay. Uh, and the uh, title, here it is. Here's the statute. Yeah. This is, this is the 24 page bill that actually got passed. This is, this is the 64 page bill, the much bigger 64 page bill that was passed by the United States Senate, hmm. okay? And here's the bill that was passed by the House of Representatives, the 24-page bill, and it says right on here 
It says within 300 days, uh, you are uh, ordered to transmit uh, to the National Security Archives all of this information that you have. Uh, this is uh, right, right. This is these are these are the provisions. These are the provisions here. That, that's why that, that's why you have lawyers <laughs> to say, yeah. look at there's the bill right there. That's the law that was passed by the United States Congress. They're the ones that drafted and passed this the 64 page bill that sets up this entire step by step. And, and the actual term is the UAP, you know, controlled disclosure campaign plan. That that's they're charged with putting it together. Okay, and enrolled, and, and it's a seven year sunset clause on it. So you know exactly what it is they're talking about. You know, uh, so that this is a, this is a huge news story, uh, that, that people need to understand that the fact that, that all of the forces that were necessary to get a unanimous decision on the part of the United States Senate, that it wanted to have a controlled disclosure program put up and become operational starting on October 18th of 2024, uh, is a huge story. And the fact that uh, you know t- three or four people in the House of Representatives blocked getting getting some of it put together, which is a lot of the enforcement provision. For example, you know that they 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 took out of there the the fact that uh, there would be a full panel set up, the nine person panel that the Senate wanted set up to be able to oversee the review of all of this information uh, and to make sure that there was a maximum uh, effort to get it publicly released. And to be able to fight back against any effort to resist it on the part of the intelligence communities or the military uh, community, that they had subpoena power, they had the authority to go to the attorney general's office in the Justice Department and get them subpoenaed. Uh, they could bring an action in the United States Federal District Court uh, to have the court authorize uh, the issuance of a subpoena to make them bring the information in. You know, it was it was thoroughly done on the part of the Senate. That's the part that the House freaked out about. He said, no, 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 no. Let's just order them to do it. Uh, and let's uh, pretend like we're going to assume that they're going to act in good faith and provide it, you know, like this. But everybody knows better. You know, uh, these are the same people that, you know, when they were ordered by the Congress to produce the, the videotapes of the tortures uh, at Abu Ghraib, uh, d- destroyed all the videotapes, <laughs> you know. After they were ordered by Congress, so that we we knew uh, the people that were involved in drafting the sixty-four page bill knew very well. The lawyers knew what you had to do to to put in all of the different provisions that would enable you to track these people down, uh, knowing that they're going to hold back the information. So uh, so there's a, a struggle going on now uh, to try to enforce this, but uh, the United States Senate is on the job. And the United States Senate has determined that it's going to get this information. And I'm confident they are. In fact, they are getting the information because the whistleblowers are coming to them now, knowing that the United States Senate has stated publicly that this is what they want done. And so the whistleblowers are coming over to them to talk with them uh, and give them the information. Uh, And that's what's happening as we speak. Ahora me gustaría mostraros el tema central de hoy. Son las declaraciones de Carl Neal en un evento SALT y Connections Nueva York 2024. Recordemos que Neal es un distinguido jefe militar retirado anteriormente asociado con el grupo de trabajo de fenómenos anómalos no identificados del gobierno de los Estados Unidos. Este hombre fue coronel, fue alto cargo del ejército e investigó de primera mano los ovnis y lo dejó bastante claro, existen inteligencias no humanas y que las mismas han estado interactuando con nuestra especie. Neil dijo, existe inteligencia no humana, la inteligencia no humana ha estado interactuando con la humanidad, esta interacción no es nueva y ha estado ocurriendo desde hace tiempo. Y personas no electas en el gobierno son conscientes de ello. Hay cero dudas. Preguntaréis, ¿pero entonces por qué diablos no lo reconocen como algo real? Pues Neil contestó y dijo que hay bastantes razones para no reconocerlos y para no admitirlos bajo ningún concepto. En concreto nombró seis razones. 
1. Preocupaciones de seguridad nacional. 2. Falta de un plan concreto. 3. Potencial para la disrupción social. 4. Posibilidad de acuerdos no públicos con otras inteligencias. 5. Posibles irregularidades y el deseo de encubrirlas. Y 6. Intransigencia organizacional básica y la falta de prioridad en el tema. El ex militar de alto rango dijo que se podría gestionar tranquilamente como la energía nuclear, es decir, que no está clasificada, todo el mundo la conoce y es cuidadosamente controlada. También dijo que es irresponsable que aborden esta cuestión sin los medios adecuados. Finalmente concluyó que la gente tenía derecho a saber la verdad y que de aquí a 2030 podría ocurrir una revelación increíble. Por su parte, el oceanógrafo exdirector de la NOAA y contraalmirante retirado de la Marina de Estados Unidos, Tim Galaudet, ha salido rápidamente en defensa de Carniel sobre visitas de inteligencias no humanas y ha revelado en LinkedIn que Neil fue muy valiente afirmando eso y que tiene razón. Añadió que la falta de aceptación pública se hace evidente por una campaña de desinformación del gobierno estadounidense y que lo ideal es que todo esto se divulgue de forma controlada. Y ojo, porque Galaudet está tan seguro de todo esto que va a ser uno de los denunciantes en la próxima conferencia en el Congreso de los Estados Unidos. Lo cual es asombroso y muy intrigante. Y ojo, porque los meses que nos quedan de año 2024 van a ser extremadamente emocionantes respecto a este fenómeno. Recordemos que hay una enmienda de divulgación de OVNIs en la Ley de Autorización de Defensa Nacional de 2024, que obligará a todas las agencias federales a entregar toda la documentación sobre ovnis antes del 20 de octubre de 2024. Además, Tim Barchett, que bueno, ya hemos hablado muchas veces de él, es uno de los representantes del Congreso, presentará un proyecto de ley que de aprobarse obligará incluso al presidente de los Estados Unidos a ordenar la desclasificación completa del material OVNI. Y todo eso va a ocurrir este año. Así que está clarísimo que se vienen cosas muy importantes en lo que queda de este año 2024 y yo creo que estamos bastante cerca de conocer la verdad. Queda por saber si van a admitir definitivamente todo esto que está pasando, si la desclasificación OVNI nos va a revelar algo importante o si van a manipular todos esos documentos desclasificados cuando se desclasifiquen para que, bueno, no revelen pues la realidad del asunto. Es el temor que yo tengo, pero de todas maneras imagino que todo esto se mirará con lupa y que si alteran algo se notará que ha sido alterado. Quiero suponer que sí. En cualquier caso le haremos un seguimiento a esto porque merece tener un seguimiento el tema OVNI este año, porque cada vez hay más personas que están respaldando esto. Altos cargos políticos, tenemos ya un gran abanico de personas que respaldan todo esto. Y el hecho de que haya preocupaciones de seguridad nacional ya lo indica. Hello and thank you for joining this edition of Reality Check. Now, let's have a think about what we all fantasize about in this UAP UFO subject. All we really want is for somebody in the know to stand up somewhere on a stage and tell it like it really is, spill his guts, reveal all, and we can all go home and get on with our lives. Well, to some degree, that's what a lot of people are saying Carl Nell, Colonel Carl Nell, did the former director of the UAP task force for the Pentagon when he stood up on stage in New York City in front of the SALT conference attendees on the 21st of May. Here's the million dollar question. Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. It was an extraordinary admission that made everybody sit up and take notice. Under questioning from Alex Clocus, when Carl was asked about his views on non-human intelligence, he said, quote, Non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. There are unelected people in the government 
that are aware of this. And then Alex asked him, how confident are you that this is true? Quick as a flash, he responded, there is zero doubt. That was the moment. That was one of the most fun moments in the last few years, to see somebody who clearly knows all, somebody who's cleared for top secret SCI material, telling it like it really is. So Colonel Carl we doffs our hat to you. And it's not just any bloke we're talking about here. Colonel Carnell, if he'd stayed in the military, would likely have become a Brigadier General. This is one very senior US Army officer. He's ex-US Army Space Command, ex-Northrop Grumman, ex-Lockheed Martin, ex-Bell Labs, ex-CTO for a $2 billion company, a former Reserve Army Brigade Commander, a former Senior Advisor to the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, a Deputy Chief of Staff to the Combatant Command, the man who advised Army Futures Command on the reorganisation of the Army Reserves, the largest since the 1970s, and a former director of the Pentagon's UAP task force. This is one high-powered bloke. I first met Carl late last year at the Seoul Conference and then earlier on this year in Washington, D.C. He's a very softly spoken, calm guy, and you can see how he developed his qualities of leadership. He's a very impressive guy. One of the things that uh, we can explore is the issue that he's being criticised for, because a lot of people across social media, the usual suspects, are saying, where's the evidence? They're suggesting it's all a big yawn, that what he said really wasn't anything new. And to some degree, they're right. It wasn't anything new. What Colonel Nell said has been said by Lou Elizondo, David Grush, and Chris Mellon, and many others. It was the way he said it. It was the clear resolve and the fact that he obviously had a prepared statement that made it very, very clear he was ready for the question and he wanted to make a point. It's interesting also to note that Colonel Nell was one of the primary sources for Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal's original news story that broke the David Grush allegations and backed the veracity of the David Grush allegations, citing themselves as first-hand witnesses. It's very, very clear that Colonel Nell knows a lot that he can't talk about publicly. And this is why this whole debate about, oh, where's the evidence, where's the data, is very, very stupid, because the people asking those questions know full well that Colonel Nell is a patriot, just like all of these insiders. They don't want to recklessly breach their national security oaths. They're bound by the constraints of their top secret SCI clearances. Now, that doesn't mean that the story is never going to get told. What it means, though, is that there has to be a controlled narrative to what we, the public, get told. Now, I hate that as much as you do. I'm a journo. I want to find things out and dig up secrets. And if I can, I will. But people like Colonel Nell are not in a position to be able to say publicly why they know what they know. So, Colonel Nell was copping a lot of stick for citing the former Canadian Defence Minister, Paul Hellyer, and the former Israeli uh, space agency boss, Haim Ashid, for saying that this is why there is data, this is why he believes what he says. And I don't believe for a moment that that's the basis for his belief. I think he duck past and Alex kind of let him off the hook by not following up with another question, which is, do you have first-hand knowledge? What knowledge do you personally have that has informed you as to why you know that NHI are being are engaging with humanity and have been doing so for a very long time? There are hints that biography I read you was a biography that Carl himself gave to the SALT conference. But when I went back and had a look at his LinkedIn, prompted by a very kind member of the audience here, I noticed what my audience friend had pointed out, which is that Carl didn't mention one period of service he had 
right back in the early 2000s when he was working for DIA, the Defence Intelligence Agency, as a tech int operations officer. And whilst he was working for Operation Iraqi Freedom in the Middle East, he was in charge or he was one of the people planning with the so-called Foreign Material Programme. And he served as the J2, which is essentially the primary intelligence officer, for the One Star Combined Joint Captured Materiel Exploitation Centre, the JCMEC in Iraq. Now that's quite significant to me because the FMP, the Foreign Material Exploitation Programme, is where I'm hearing a lot of this alleged retrieval operation internationally is being conducted with America's Five Eyes allies, including Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the UK. When there is allegedly a retrieval of some kind of exotic technology, be it foreign adversary or something else, quite often allies like Australia, the UK, Canada and New Zealand are called in to assist. And that's where I thought it was very telling that the foreign material program is something on Carl Nell's CV that he didn't mention to SALT. This current cycle happened last December with the Schumer Amendment, and then it got rolled back, it was defeated in the House. And so it remains to be seen, you know, if the process could continue. One hopes and and can maybe draw a little bit of um, uh, confidence that maybe this will come around is the colloquy that uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Rounds had back in December. After their amendment got killed, they basically went on the Senate floor and articulated their rationale for the legislation. And I think uh, Senator Schumer, to quote him, almost said it was a travesty that this did not pass. The United States government has gathered a great deal of information about UAPs over many decades, but has refused to share it with the American people. We've also been notified by multiple credible sources that information on UAPs has also been withheld from Congress, which, if true, is a violation of the laws requiring full notification to the legislative branch. Not everything that we wanted, but we'll continue to move forward and uh, find additional transparency. So this is, you know, a bipartisan colloquy on a topic that I guess most people would probably consider fringe, and yet these two senators felt the need to do that and to double down on their a desire to see this through. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see maybe a reintroduction of some version of that this summer uh, with the goal of maybe putting it into the NDAA by the end yeah. of the year. One of the other things I think we should talk about is the fact that what came out of Colonel Nell's speech to Salt was that he's intimating that there's going to be another tilt at bringing the Schumer Amendment, the key protections for whistleblowers who want to come forward about UAPs, he wants another go at getting that Schumer Amendment before the Congress into the NDAA, the National Defence Authorisation Act, before the end of the year. And he's not saying categorically that he thinks we are going to see disclosure. In fact, he said quite wearily and resignedly to Alex, this sort of disclosure emphasis has come and gone over time. And so this is not the first time we've arrived at this stage. He said, I would suggest that maybe the peak of this current cycle happened last December with the Schumer Amendment, and then it got rolled back and was defeated in the House. And so it remains, he said, to be seen if the process is good to continue. I think that's an admission that we really are at a crunch point here. Mike Turner, the uh, congressman from Ohio, very successfully nobbled with a group of House representatives attempts to bring the Schumer Amendment through the House late last year. And this, I think, stalled attempts to get UAP disclosure before the key oversight committees such as the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence and the Senate Armed Services Committee and the HASC, the House Armed Services Committee. There is a very determined cadre of politicians in those committees who I do think, if they know that they've got witnesses coming forward who feel safe about speaking out as whistleblowers, they will do so. And this is why the Schumer Amendment matters. And frankly, it's why the squawking and ranting from the critics out there who say, where's the evidence? Bring us the data. 
uh, Colonel Nell's evidence wasn't anything new. They don't matter a jot. They're irrelevant to the debate because it's not us, the public, out here that have to be convinced. It's Congress. It's Congress that has to be swayed. What needs to happen right now is key opinion leaders in the Congress need to be convinced that there is sufficient evidence to justify what we hope might be a kind of church committee style public inquiry where the people responsible for this program, the gatekeepers of the legacy retrieval and reverse engineering program, can be summoned under oath and compelled to give evidence before the Congress in a public hearing, just like the CIA was held to account right back in the 1970s, 50 years ago. This is really important stuff. And I think the, the arguments we're seeing about whether or not Carl Nell said much at all, whether or not he provided any data, are really ridiculous and absurd because the people making those criticisms know full well Nell's a patriot, as are Mellon, Elizondo, Grush, and everybody else who's intimating that they are aware of first hand knowledge about this program. They can't speak about it publicly because they know it's tied up in a litany of orchestrated lies, secrets tied up with a bow and NDAs inside the Pentagon and the intelligence community and also out in private aerospace. This is a secret that wants to be kept. And the only way that it can be revealed is if Congress is compelled to do its job. And the reasons for non-disclosure included national security, keeping the knowledge from adversaries, protecting people from themselves. What a patronising label that would be. Lack of a credible plan, the idea that NHI intentions remain unknown. And the idea also that new physics and technologies have unpredictable ramifications. I actually think the um, pro-disclosure argument is a slightly warped version of that, which is my increasing suspicion is that the United States has developed these technologies to such a point that they feel they have a technological advantage and that by revealing even the existence of NHI, it's a slippery slope and that what we'll see eventually is a forced disclosure, a catastrophic disclosure of the fact that the US is in possession of technology that it thinks might give it an advantage in any future conflict with a foreign adversary. The other arguments pro non-disclosure were societal disruption, which again I think is patronising. I think we're well over that. My daughter's generation is well aware and very interested and engaged in the UAP subject. They're not frightened at all by the possibility of a non-human intelligence. So I think that creepy idea that we're also religious or we're also conservative and we can't bear the idea of actually having to deal with the concept of NHI is patronising, irrelevant and old-fashioned. The other one that I thought was very interesting was when Carl Nell talked about the possibility that there might be covert agreements with NHI, unaccountable parties advancing unknown agendas, the idea that disclosure will precipitate or accelerate negative repercussions and that there might be a quid pro quo from the NHI itself. It's not the first time people have talked from the inside about agreements, covert agreements. You might remember in my interview with David Grush a year ago, he acknowledged that there was, in his DOPSA, talk of agreements, but he was very, very vague. He didn't want to talk much at all on camera about what that all meant. Interesting. Put that one in your top pocket. And the final two that I think are also very significant against disclosure are cover for misdeeds. The idea that there would be significant criminal misconduct or violation of civil liberties revealed or the idea that there would be revelations of an unequitable accrual of power, privilege, or monetary gain. I think there's a lot to that. I think, frankly, it combines with the final point that Carl made, which is organisational intransigence. The Pentagon, the intelligence community, are obdurate bureaucracies. They're not moved easily. It's much, much easier to bury a secret than to admit one especially when it's stinky. Now, the pros for disclosure gave me a smile on my face. Ultimately, 
it's quite clear where Colonel Nell lies. He talked about the moral right and ultimately how NHI existence is ultimately not government information, that the pursuit of happiness requires knowledge of the world as it is, and that government is for the people, not the reverse, and that it's time to restore proper oversight and accountability and redress misdeeds. He also warned about the importance of avoiding catastrophic disclosure, that essentially all the reasons that have been cited in the anti-disclosure will fall in a heap if, as appears increasingly likely, this whole story is going to spill out into the open anyway, and these people will be dragged in chains out onto the forecourt of the Congress and held to account for their crimes and misdeeds. And then there's also the point that Carl made, which is the prevention of a loss of technological dominance. The idea that, again, I increasingly hear from people on the inside, that one of the things that is constraining our ability to understand this technology is the fact that the way we are doing the research, the way we are doing the science inside this legacy program is completely antithetical to good science. Scientists love to be able to share ideas, to swap ideas, to have their papers peer-reviewed and criticised. That's how humanity will make advances. Imagine if a government came out with a controlled disclosure, a measured disclosure, and said, yes, there is NHI. It's real. It has shared technology with us. But we are not going to tell you the detail of what that is, because to do so might give evil people, bad people, potential foreign adversaries, an advantage that we don't want them to have. I actually think that's a perfectly reasonable argument. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a collaboration like the Manhattan Project that finally cracks this technology once and for all? I suspect that's where Colonel Cownell lies. And full marks to him, I doff my hat to him. The man is a patriot. He, he, he showed great courage by speaking on the stage the way he did, and so does every other insider who's spoken out publicly. We should back them and we should support them. Meanwhile, remember when Tim Gallaudet said we were in contact with aliens? Well, here he expounds on that a little bit. Let's give a listen. Do you think we've had communications with non-human intelligence? I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Just based on all this data and everything we're talking about, they're here. What do you think here. those communications would look like? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, actually, uh, if you look at Diana Pasuka's book again, Encounters, uh, this, this one um, uh, former NASA engineer, he called the crash, the crashes that were retrieved donations that that's a form of communication right there, uh, yeah. And and uh, so I I don't know the nature of the communication and initially and who was doing the communicating, but I am pretty sure from what I've seen from my sources, uh, very sure, highly, that, uh, that 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 that's occurred. Okay, so I wish he would tell us what he meant by that. Uh, he's talking about uh, the indirect form of communication in the form of uh, donations, if that's what's going on, uh, with these uh, UFO crashes. Are they gifting us technology? And if so, is that a form of communication? Well, I guess so, if that's what's going on. It's unclear to me that that is what's going on, since a lot of these UFO crashes are actually shoot-downs. I don't think that's a gift, but who knows? Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe they are martyring themselves uh, so that we can have this technology. Uh, allowing themselves to be shot down. I suppose it's always possible, but that's not what I want to know about. I want to know about the direct communications that some people deep within the UFO control group seem to be having, uh, judging by uh, repeated uh, witness accounts, experiencer accounts, uh, of seeing beings working alongside humans, uh, military and government officials, and also uh, from more direct sources, uh, more government sort of sources as well, uh, you get this, uh, this picture that the control group is working with the beings. So uh, Tim says he has sources that confirm that we are in contact. It's unclear if he means direct contact, uh, like that would be, or if he means this more indirect contact, uh, like with gifting UFOs. So uh, let's see. Okay, this this is really neat. Okay, so I've I've 
uh, reported before about Japan's new UFO program. Well, now we're getting more details with a connection to the Nazca mummies. Former Japan, uh, Japan's Minister of Defense will lead the establishment of a group to investigate UFOs. Uh, Hamada will chair the first meeting of a rep of the representatives nonpartisan group on June 2nd or uh, 6th. They will seek cooperation with the U.S. on the matter and urge the government to act. Very cool.